welcome to the second day of the winter school. Uh, first of all, I would like to just apologize for the delay, but that's what happens when you have both the session chair and the speaker being Greek. So that's <laughs> actually there is traffic, that's all. So uh, we are very happy to uh, have as a speaker Professor Agilus Kayas. Uh, he is a professor and chair of cybersecurity at the University of Edinburgh and an expert in blockchain and program security of the blockchain system. Um, he, before his current position, uh, he was at the University of uh, Athens and uh, Yukon in the US. And we are very happy to have him here to talk to us about proving the security of blockchain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, talk to you about the proving the security of blockchain protocols, which is a topic that uh, I've worked in the last few years uh, with a lot of enthusiasm. So let's see if this works. Yeah. So if you want a topic. Well, the grand title here is Foundations of Blockchain Protocols. We try to understand the fundamental of the security problems of those protocols. What are they? How can we prove them? So, proving security requires to define a proper and desired model and then give mathematical arguments why a given protocol satisfies the properties that it's supposed to satisfy in this model. So before I start discussing about blockchain protocols, so just I would like to take a few minutes to give you a little bit of perspective about how we do that in computer security in general. Because that is going to be um, a good inspirational starting point that uh, will guide us through this presentation. So when you build a secure system, um, you have an objective. And this objective has to be precisely defined. Something <coughs> whose importance cannot be understated. And that's something I will come back to it in the course of the presentation. So once you have the objective, then you can ask, what are the resources that can be utilized by the parties that are actually going to be engaged in a certain implementation that attempts to meet that objective? At the same time, you define a threat model which tries to capture precisely how the adversary should operate. And furthermore, the threat model should be general enough that captures all possible attacks that seem to be relevant for the practical deployment of a certain system that meets that objective. So given those, a candidate solution is provided, is designed, is laid out. And then, using a set of assumptions, we attempt to provide a security which establishes that the candidate solution meets the objective in the threat model under the assumptions given, assuming that the resources that have been postulated are available to the parties that are running the problem. And once we have this, we can start asking questions which will enable us to criticize how well we have achieved, how well our, our candidate solution has achieved its objective. For example, are these resources indeed available? For instance, randomness is a resource which is frequently assumed in many protocols, and the existence of high quality private randomness to the entities participating in the protocol is something that Frequently is a shooting protocols, but at the same time, when 
security problems arise, it's one of the possible attack points. Is the threat model realistic? Are these really all the attacks we care about? Or is it in practice that there are other attacks that are more relevant and circumvent the expression that defines our adversary the threat model? Are the assumptions plausible? Do they actually hold in reality? And finally, even if you have all those, you can start asking, is the solution that was created really efficient? Because it could be the case that there are many different solutions that meet a certain objective under different assumptions and choosing the right one, finding the right one and understanding completely the design space is an important endeavor in this science of computer security that we are describing. Just make a stop. Without going into much detail, I would like to appreciate what does it mean to have an objective? So when we say we have an objective, we do not mean something which is vaguely described as something like that. Alice and Bob want to communicate securely. In cryptography over the years, we've developed very precise ways to describe what is an objective. And this is just a snapshot which is not supposed for you to read, but it will just give you an appreciation of how something which is vaguely described like this is casted in high precision in terms of pseudocode. And I should say this definition, which is the definition of the key exchange protocol, is just the tip of the iceberg of what happens in those papers that attempt to properly capture uh, the objectives that are of relevance for various different security applications that we care about. So how good are we with this? So I'll just give you secure examples, and I'll try to map it to the previous roadmap. And secure channel, as you obviously know, is one of the most important problems in computer security and cryptography. I mean, this is the problem. The first thing that we heard about when you started attending um, or studying the area. So what we want is to build a secure channel between the two parties. And this problem was put forth, at least in its modern form, in a seminal paper of Dick and Hellman in 76. And since then, it's interesting to observe that our community has been actively researching how this objective can be reached following the roadmap which I've outlined. And I'm showing you here a specific instance. So over time, here are resources that we have isolated as the ones that we would like to have available to the parties. There is randomness available. There is a PKI for some way to authenticate channels. There is a TCP IP protocol as an underlying communication infrastructure. So these are the resources that are available to the parties that are engaged in the protocol. There is an active man in the middle attacker as part of the threat model, which means that the attacker is active in the sense that not only is the attacker eavesdropping on um, what the parties are communicating to each other, but actually attempts to interfere with their communication. So the Divi Hellman protocol um, in 1976 that was the first description of how this objective has been reached. And it's interesting to see how more than 30 years later, there are still like efforts in specifying fully this protocol. That's in the form of TLS 1.2. You may know now that TLS 1.3 um, is um, underway in here. And we're still like looking into how these protocols are defined and specified. The first security proofs, 
starting in the early 80s for secure channel protocols coming with Dole Yao, took us again 30, more than 30 years, and that's from a publication just three years ago now in crypto, where the first, for the first time a complete proof of the protocol as implemented was given. Here's the assumption. The decision of the Hellman assumption is an assumption that can be used to prove security of that. So this just gives you a glimpse of the breadth in the sequence of time that it takes to fully understand a problem, which I should say is, is seemingly as simple as, as a secure time. So what about the Bitcoin blockchain as an objective? How can we map it in this picture? So interestingly, the first thing we have about Bitcoin is actually not the objective, but it's the protocol itself. So the solution presents itself first. The resources that are available are also not completely spelled out. But it appears that we are in a setting where we do have a broadcast which is not authenticated and it's not reliable. Not reliable here means that it's a broadcast that can, uh, can be manipulated by adversaries and provides diverging views to different parties that are on the receiving end of these protocols. The threat model states something about the hashing power of the adversary, and this is also vaguely stated. And the objective itself isn't clear, but it should like something that has to do with the reliable record of transactions. Finally, the basic assumptions have to do with the properties of an underlying hash function, and also two, which are, some of them we know, collision resistance, but there are others that are much harder to define, like how well, for example, SHA-256 defines a proof of work, and what is a proof of work exactly in this context. Well, the security proof itself is elusive. So this is like basically the picture as it was a few years after Nakamoto introduced Bitcoin. And as Bitcoin started to become very popular, more and more people started to look at it from a formal security point of view. And of course, the parallel that was there from the beginning was consensus. Because consensus, contrary to Bitcoin blockchain, is a problem that we understand well in computer science. It's a classical problem, actually, in computer science. It's one of those problems that illustrates the beauty of computer science like few others. It is not a number theoretic problem. It is not, if you want, a mathematical problem in the strict definition, in the strict sense. It is a problem that has to do with information. And a problem that has to do with the ability of parties that while are, they are decentralized and they are operate in the presence of an adversary that attempts to confuse them, how is it possible for those parties to reach a single view? This problem was introduced in the in the 80s, and there's still, understandably, a lot of interest in it that has been, that has been reinvigorated, uh, I should say, with the introduction of video. So what is the consensus problem? So if you would like to see the objective of consensus, um, here is a very simple single slide over here. So, we have a number of parties, and let's say they would like to decide on the simplest possible form of information, like just one bit. They start with uh, their own inputs, which are their attempts to insert a bit in the protocol, and they would like to conclude on a value B, which should satisfy the following 
parameters. When looking at these properties, even though they are informally stated here, you should understand them in the presence of an adversary that controls a subset of those parties running the protocol and has the objective to violate those properties. So the first one says agreement. Agreement basically means that all the parties should output the same value. The second property, validity, says that if all of these parties have the same insert bit, then this should actually be the output they produce. And finally, termination states that parties should actually terminate all of them and produce output. It's interesting to point out that the conjunction of those three properties is what makes the problem non-trivial. Actually, if you for example, like, do not want to satisfy validity, it's extremely simple to satisfy the other two properties. Just write a protocol that outputs zero. This protocol clearly satisfies agreement and termination. Nevertheless, it's also a useless protocol. There is nothing about the input of the parties that is present in your output. Similarly, if you would like to just satisfy validity, it's extremely simple to write a protocol that does that. Just have every party output its input. The output is clearly one of the inputs if all the honest parties agree. However, if the honest parties disagree at the beginning, their agreement is violated. <coughs> of course, if you forgo termination, you have a protocol that doesn't terminate, and is also equally not useful. So here's the consensus problem, and it is a very interesting problem to solve with a protocol when the parties are operating against an adversary. So there are many ways to solve it that we studied over the years, and here is an exemplary instantiation uh, using the Donald Strong protest problem. So the objective is consensus, and suppose you have authenticated point-to-point -point channels. Then suppose that the adversary now commands a minority of resources, which resources here should be interpreted as the number of uh, parties running the protocol. Now there is a very simple reduction that if you apply this dollar strong protocol multiple times, and you assume that these little signatures are secure, can actually get a proof that this solves consensus in a synchronous model. Now, this is not the only way to solve the problem, and we actually come a long way, and we are now able to solve it in various ways that actually improve on many of those assumptions. But the point is that um, consensus have been looked at, has been looked at um, from a formal security point of view as an objective. Um, so why is this not good for us? And it seems that the Bitcoin blockchain tries to do something similar. So we can just run consensus, um, let's say, in all the transactions, and then we're going to produce an undisputable public record where we will um, be able to refer to for all the things that um, are in, for all the things that the parties are engaged in. Probably. Well, the problem is actually this part. So, one of the fundamental assumptions here is that the resource available to the parties is the fact that there are authenticated point-to-point -point channels. While, when I was describing Bitcoin as the blockchain as an objective, it was an unreliable authenticated broadcast. So these two things are quite different. And it's quite if you want, also interesting and surprising at the same time, that one of the most interesting developments um, in distributed systems of the last 10 years has been essentially ignored as a research area from the vast body of literature in distributed uh, systems and in the theory of distributed systems, because mainly the vast majority of papers that were looking at the consensus problem were not 
looking at this setting. Interestingly, the setting, even though there were glimpses of it um, in, uh, in earlier work, <coughs> earlier to 2008, it is, um, was not given any serious attention until the advent of the Bitcoin blockchain code. So what is the objective of the Bitcoin blockchain code? And when I say now what is the objective, I don't mean it in a high level way, but I mean it in a, as precise, as mathematically precise as possible so that we're able to make formal statements about whether a given protocol satisfies the objective. So here's the ledger objective, which for the first time was formalized in a joint work with uh, Juan Garay and Igor Leonardo's, uh, which you can find on the ePrint ICR archive. And in the same work, we also proved the suitable abstraction of the Bitcoin protocol, what we term the Bitcoin backbone, realizes this objective. Also in the same work, we discussed how using that protocol we can achieve other primitives such as consensus. And although this requires some effort, it's possible to do. So I'm going to give you an overview of this of this work. Describe our rationale, the way we define the um, the protocol and provide the rationale behind the modeling, the security proofs, and I'll give you also a uh, complete description of uh, the proofs of security that appear in that paper. So let me start by going over the objective. Think of the ledger now as the objective. When can we say that a protocol defines a ledger? What are the properties of that protocol? So let's make first some simplifying assumptions. And these are assumptions that are helpful when you try to provide a formal model for an objective. The assumptions that we made here when we um, work on this is to consider synchrony in the following sense. Time is divided in rounds. So you think of the execution of the protocol as happening in lockstep. Parties are engaged with other parties in a synchronous fashion. They deliver messages to the network, and the network produces these messages back to them. I will show you more details about this model in a moment, but just keep that in mind at an intuitive way now that I am introducing you the two basic properties that the ledger should satisfy. So, imagine furthermore that the protocol organizes transactions in a sequence of blocks. In other words, a set of transactions appear in blocks, and blocks are connected to each other in chronological order. So given that these two observations, let's define these two properties, persistence and liveness, which capture what I would call a robust transaction ledger. As before, you should imagine these two properties as happening in the presence of an adversary that would like to violate. So, persistence talks about transactions themselves and how permanent they are. It is parameterized by a natural number k. 
and it says, if an honest party reports a transaction TX as stable, and here stable is a moniker which is given to this assessment, which is says that the transaction is in a block which is k blocks deep in the ledger of the honest party. In other words, the transaction has a number of blocks which are chronologically on top of it. So if an honest party reports a transaction as stable, then whenever an honest party reports the same transaction as stable, it will be in the same position in the ledger. So this property tells you that once you heard from one of the parties running the protocol that a transaction has been stabilized and it's given a position in the ledger, you will never hear otherwise from anyone else that is reporting that transaction as stable. Where again, stable here means that it's more than K blocks deep in the ledger. <coughs> Observe that this property by itself doesn't say much. It's very conditional. It says, if, so. What does it mean in the same position? Yeah, in the same position, because transactions are in a sequence of blocks, every transaction can be thought of having a position, like a certain block um, sort of identity and position inside the block. From the Genesis block. Basically. From the Genesis block and on. Yeah. So observe that this position is only guaranteed to be the same once one of the honest parties reported the state. So it could be the case that honest parties change their mind um, if the transaction is not stable. So as I said, this property by itself doesn't say much because it's very conditional. It says if one does something, then something else happens. So it could be the case that nothing ever happens. So we want to pair this property with some other property that we call liveness and basically tells you that things eventually happen, like good things eventually happen. If you want, this is follows this tradition in distributed systems where persistence tells you bad things don't happen and here Leibniz tells you that good things will eventually happen. So what are the good things that will eventually happen? So Leibniz is parameterized by U and K, two parameters, and it says the following. If all honest parties attempt to insert a certain transaction in the ledger and they continue to do so for a certain number of rounds, which is that parameter U, then, after the passage of this time, all the honest parties will report it as stable and will always continue to do so when the protocol continues its execution. So, bad things don't happen. Parties don't disagree about the position of stable transactions. And good things do happen. Eventually, the parties, all honest parties, will call it a transaction in a statement. Together with this, you can see how the parameter U captures transaction processing time in a very broad sense. It basically says how long you have to wait for a transaction to stabilize in the network. And in a security proof, you would expect that U will be further specified, and it's expected that it will be a function of K and potentially of other parameters. It's a little bit unclear here what is the value of the parameter K, but why K exists. And the relevance here of K is that the way we're going to establish these properties will be in a probabilistic sense. And therefore, there's going to be a probability of error, which we will show to depend 
on k, and it will be inexorably k in the in the sense of an inverse exponential. So here's the letter objective um, as we defined it um, in the TKL paper, and then the question was, how is it possible to argue in some way that the Bitcoin protocol meets that objective? So let's go into more details about how we can describe the protocol in a way which is sufficiently precise to prove that it meets that objective. So I will introduce here what I call the synchronous model for this uh, class of protocols. And this will enable us to provide a precise description of the protocol. So you have to uh, think that in this synchronous model, the time is divided in rounds. And in each round, each party is allowed a certain number of queries to a hash function. This parameter is called Q, and the hash function itself is going to be modeled as a random function, what in cryptography is called a random oracle, which is an assumption that has been frequently used in the security analysis of practical problems. It is arguably a simplified model in the sense that the random function itself is assumed to be external to the protocol while any actual implementation of the protocol will have to instantiate the random oracle with a specific hash. And of course here this is actually not a grain of salt but actually a big chunk of it of whether your instantiation of the random oracle with an actual hash function is something that will preserve its security properties. Removing the random oracle from security analysis is an important endeavor, but clearly it will be for this analysis a future step. So messages are sent via a diffusion mechanism. Now I call this a diffusion mechanism to distinguish it from broadcast and try to capture in a simple way the properties that you might get from a peer-to-peer -peer transmission of messages. Where basically you have something like a broadcast, but you have no way to authenticate the source. You have no way of guaranteeing whether all parties have exactly the same view of messages that have appeared in a single round. To facilitate this manipulation that can happen in the way messages are delivered, we use the notion of an adversary which is called rushing, and it's already very well established in, in the body of literature of modern cryptography that studies multi-party protocols. Essentially, you can think of the diffusion mechanism as a storage box where parties insert their messages that are due for delivery and you can think of the adversary which is rushing of having the final say in every round to go to this like if you want mailboxes that are waiting for the parties to access them and inject messages reorder messages and spoof their source we do assume that all, all messages will be eventually delivered in the round but nevertheless the order or their actual number, since the adversary can inject messages, cannot be guaranteed. So this already rules out a wide class of consensus protocol that actually do look at the number of messages received and try to do sensible decisions based on how many of them are equal or different and so forth. Let's model now the participants. So there are n minus c on as parties running the protocol, n is the total number of parties, and each one is producing, uh, is going to be producing q queries, the hash function. The adversary, on the other hand, is going to be controlling t of the parties, and you can think of it using another terminology from Bitcoin acting as a single malicious mining pool 
on operating against the board. We can assume, as you see, because each honest party has Q queries quota to the hash function, that this is like a flat version of the world in terms of hashing power. So obviously a flat version of the world is not the actual world, but as you can relatively easily see, it is like a worst case. So essentially, if honest parties themselves aggregate in mining pools, just because they're honest, like this just makes things better for them. Actually, the worst possible case is where you have this complete decentralization from the honest parties' perspective, and a single big mining pool acting in the control of the others. So, this is the point that is made here. Observe that this feature comes from the fact that our analysis is what we might call the traditional cryptographic setting. Bad guys versus good guys, instead of a number of rational actors running together. And the rational aspect of these protocols is extremely interesting. And I will also hint at that and there will be uh, another group representation this afternoon that I capture in the rational aspect of the protocol, of these protocols. Okay, so how do we orchestrate uh, the execution of a protocol? So suppose we have some protocol, which I'm not now yet specifying fully. So here is the actual protocol. And we would like now to understand what is an execution? How, what do we mean by running the protocol? We would like essentially to simulate the real world um, in a certain way, which is controlled and specific enough for us to prove <laughs> properties of the protocol. So here is the protocol, and you can imagine an adversary in an environment. You can think of the adversary in the environment as two parties that are acting in tandem. They're all of them, you can imagine, as probabilistic polynomial time machines. With the environment being the one that is the initiator of all the parties running the problem, including the adversary itself. The environment is the first party to be initialized, and the first party to execute. And it is the one that is going to spawn the other parties running the protocol, as well as the adversary. And it's going to create them under strict conditions. We're going to prevent, we're going to enforce that exactly n parties are created, and all of them are running an instance of the protocol parties. Now, the view of an execution is the concatenation of the view of each party at each run that is running the protocol. The whole execution terminates when the environment terminates. And we will be interested in properties of this view. When we run this execution, a key point is that there's going to be various random variables of interest. Quite importantly, there's going to be one that controls the random oracle, as well as all the points of the parties. What is, very, what is very important that's happening here is that now we do have a random variable which is completely defined and we can try to express the properties that I've defined before, persistence and liveness for instance, as predicates on this random variable. So we could look at the certain sampling of this random variable and it would say this is a sampling that violates resistance, or this is a sample that violates likeness. So this is the big benefit that we get from following this approach, which is firmly based uh, in a long line of previous works that try to formalize the meaning of security for multi-party cryptographic protocols, notably secure multi-party computation. Let's uh, get a closer look 
on how this uh, execution is going to work. And I'm going to give you like a view of this execution at the end of one round, in the beginning of the next round, let's say round I. So, let's start at the beginning of the round. What happens at the beginning of the round is the environment is providing inputs to the partners. Those inputs, for example, for example, can be sets of transactions that are to be included in the ledger. But you don't have to restrict yourself now in this interpretation, even though this is the one that we're going to use when we're going to describe formally uh, the Bitcoin problem. So the environment here is providing input to the parties running the protocol. And the parties will actually perform the steps of the protocol. The parties will have access, as you see here, to a hash function, which will be modeled as a separate entity and is going to be is going to be uncorrectable from the point of view of the others. Both the users and the adversary will have access to the hash function. And when they query the hash function, they may have interesting answers. In the case of the Bitcoin protocol, jumping ahead, those interesting answers will be like proofs of work. Some of the parties, when they get some, such interesting outputs, will put them in this broadcast diffusion mechanism which may be manipulated by the adversary. So at the end of this round, what's going to happen is that the parties will be executed in sequence. They're going to ask queries to the hash function, deposit their messages to the broadcast functionality, and allow the adversary to manipulate those messages as well as ask the hash function itself. Note that this is not exactly how it's happening in the real world, where things are actually concurrent. But th this, the difference here, makes only things better for us. We just serialize the whole execution. So the concurrency of the real world here is serialized in an execution where honest parties are um, executed in sequence, and the adversary is given the final say in every round, subject to certain restrictions, like, for instance, the adversary is not allowed to drop messages. So for instance, here the yellow uh, box, which is uh, discovered and broadcasted by one of the honest parties, must be present in the incoming tapes of all the honest parties in the next round. The adversary may, of course, inject its own messages. It may inject them in arbitrary order. It may even omit them from the incoming tapes of some of the honest parties. Particular, this shows you, it illustrates graphically how the honest parties will have a diverging view about the messages that are uh, floating in the network in a single round. So, here is how the round structure of the model works. So, once we have this, I would like you now to be assured that this can be defined precisely in the sense that we do have this random variable that describes the execution. And now it's time to define the property of a protocol. So here, the property of a protocol is defined in an abstract sense as a predicate. The property is a predicate which has as input the view of the problem. So a protocol by number of parties and you which control by the adversary, predicate Q, has property Q which is an arbitrary predicate, with error epsilon if and only if this happens. For all adversaries, for all environments, the probability that the view of the protocol in the execution with the adversary A in the environment Z satisfies predicate Q is very close to 1 but the small epsilon error. And typically, we would like this epsilon error very small, to some security parameter, let's say. So here, all this formalism I introduced so far enable us to describe precisely 
properties of protocols and when they are achieved. Now, once we have a protocol, we are able to express properties of the protocol formally and try to prove them by writing a theorem that establishes this fact. What makes it difficult from a security proof point of view is these universal quantifiers that you see here. Essentially, we have to prove that no matter what the adversary does, and no matter how the environment acts and provides inputs to the partners, the protocol will not be violated with all by a small x owner. So this model is quite general. And the thing is that even though we are in this synchronous setting, the generality of the model enables us to capture many ill behaviors that happen in the real world setting. For example, imagine that some parties receive only some of the messages, which is something that happens in, frequently in reality. That's fine. We can, we can simulate that by having those, par those parties integrated as part of the adversary, since we have quantified over all possible adversaries, and have the adversary uh, drop some of the messages that they receive. Suppose there is a large mining pool, this person performing some type of selfish mining, for instance, which is a known attack against Bitcoin, uh, against the Bitcoin blockchain protocol. It's also something that we can express in the protocol. And of course, any combination of that. This is the big power that comes from having a universal quantification over all possible adversaries in an expressive model like the one I showed. Is that you don't have now to look at specific attacks, but, but you can argue that your protocol works against all possible attacks within the model. Given the model is expressive enough, um, you are able to extract meaningful statements about its security. So let me now come now to the protocol. Because so far we're talking about a model that uh, within which we can express the protocol and its properties. And now it's time to come and describe the protocol. So obviously, even though the, the model is expressive enough, there's no way to take directly the Bitcoin implementation and describe it in this model. Even though this is an ultimate goal that we surely hope at some point to reach, we're not there yet. In the image of secure channels that I showed you in the beginning of the presentation, from the dollar yao modeling of secure channels to the security proofs that TLS, about TLS, there were more than 30 years of active research that took us from an abstraction of the protocol to the security proof of an actual implementation. Hopefully, it's not going to be 30 years for Bitcoin, but clearly, we need to start from somewhere. And we have to start from an abstraction. And this abstraction is what we call the Bitcoin Backbone Protocol, because it's a simplified algorithmic version of the Bitcoin client. And that abstracts away many uh, aspects of the actual implementation while it maintains, if you want, its consensus ledger-like core, or at least so we hope. So another important feature of the way we describe the backbone protocol, and also explains uh, the name we chose for it, is that we make a conscious distinction between the data structure, which is the blockchain, and the application layer, which is the transaction. So we wanted to um, remove the transactions from the equation. Like we felt that what is here more relevant is to try to understand the security properties of the data structure and try to remove the transactional layer, not as something that is not important, but as something that has to be studied separately on top of the analysis that we could do, uh, focusing only on the data structure. Moreover, we felt, and it was a step in the correct direction, that if we did that, we just study the data structure, 
There could be other things that could be um, solved using the same data structure operation, and, and this was the motivation for, for doing this separation and calling this um, the backbone protocol. As we will see, we will use this backbone protocol to solve other problems, uh, and notably consensus, um, in this setting. So the protocol itself is the one you're familiar with, um, or at least an abstraction of what you're familiar with. What is important to keep in mind is this uh, three functions, V, I, and R, which are going to be abstracting away all the application layer aspects of the problem. I will overview this, uh, just to give you a feeling of exactly how uh, we define it. So, we have two hash functions, G and H. In the execution, they are going to be modeled as random models. And players will have a state called C, and it will be in the form of a blockchain. That is going to have the following structure. Um, in every block, there's going to be three elements, S, X, and CDR. S is going to be a hash of a previous block, and X is going to be some input that is otherwise left unspecified. In the case of Bitcoin, this input, for example, might be a set of transactions. But we're not interested in actually specifying what this input is. And in fact, it might be different in other applications. CTR, on the other hand, is something which is, doesn't have a specific function, at least at the application layer, but it's something that when we hash S and X together with G, and then this output of G together with CTR, we get a hash value which is less than T. Now, T is a parameter of the protocol, which is called the target. And this is what specifies the proof of work aspect of each block. So now you see that we can change blocks like that together, and what is the output? It's a blockchain. All that is anchored to an initial genesis block that for our purposes can just be an empty thing. It's not of interest of what are its contents as we're going to be analyzing the protocol in what is called the standalone setting. The contents of the blockchain are defined by these XI values which are present in every block. And themselves, in order to satisfy uh, the validity, they have to pass this predicate V. So this is the first specification. Um, we are not interested in defining the way V works in this, uh, in this high level description. We just want to say that the chain is going to be valid as long as it has this structural property that is defined here between G and H, and at the same time the validity predicate is satisfied. So what happens within every round? Players will obtain this special input from the environment, which you can think of it as a symbol that instructs them to insert a certain value x. And given that value x, given that input from the environment, which could be multiple such symbols, they will pass them to this capital I function, which will use all the local information of the player, including the blockchain, and perhaps a private or public state that the player may have, and will produce the input x. So basically, this value is going to be processed by i and prepared for inclusion in the blockchain. It could be the case that i itself is just the identity function. Nevertheless, in all the applications we have, we have some strict requirements about i that include as the necessary minimal requirement that I introduces some entropy uh, into the little x function. So the minimum output here for I is going to be the input x plus a sufficiently long random noise. Subsequently, the parties will use their cube queries to the hash function to obtain a new block by trying different CTR values starting from zero. Once they found such block, they will do a transmission, which I'll show you next. So let's say we have a player here which finds a new block that extends it. 
once this is found, the new chain is going to be propagated to all players via this diffusion mechanism, the underlying yeah. other problems. Finally, in its round, no player is going to be married in its blockchain. At the beginning of the round, every player is going to compare all incoming chain with a local chain, and if a longer chain is found, it will be adopted instead. Previous chain is going to be removed. Observe here, longer here works because I'm analyzing the protocol in a static setting where the same target is used throughout the protocol execution. Finally, and that's the last uh, function, R, which is left unspecified, a player, when it's given a read symbol from the environment, is going to process its blockchain uh, according to that. Again, we do not care to specify how the player reads the contents of its blockchain. So here is the actual pseudocode. Uh, which describes whatever I say. And even though I'm not going to go over it, um, I think the value of this is to say that this is a precise object. The theorems that we're going to be uh, proving are going to be with respect to that given pseudocode description that fully determines how the protocol operates. So here is the validate predicate that checks whether a chain is valid. It does the things that you would expect from such a predicate. It uh, checks that all blocks are valid and goes in a big repeat until loop uh, that checks that the whole chain is valid. Here is the proof of work pseudocode that is given some input x to insert in the chain and the chain and then goes to a while loop that attempts to find a proof of work. And finally, this is the main loop of the protocol that what it does in perpetuity is that it picks the best chain from the ones that it sees in the network and its local one. It determines the next input to be inserted. It tries to find a new block to extend its local chain. And if it does so, it transmits it to the network. We're almost done with a description of the protocol. There are only some requirements that uh, have to be added. First one is the input function i should produce inputs that are acceptable according to v. I mean, otherwise, that's a minimum requirement. Like if i produces things that make no sense, then the protocol would actually do no progress. And another thing is the input entropy. The function i on the same input should not produce the same output with the robotic Given that we are in the random oracle model, like it's very easy to prove this property of input entropy by assuming that a random nonce is part of the output of R. In practice, there are many ways that in the actual protocols, like a random nonce uh, is included. And in the random oracle, it's very easy to argue that there's going to be a very small probability that the parties would choose the random nonce twice. It's going to be also a small probability that the G function would output those values, would output the same value. These things would amount essentially to a hash function collision, which is a small probability event uh, in the case of random oracle, and something that we don't believe um, can be mounted, at least against the uh, hash functions that we currently believe are secure, including some that the six was used in the Bitcoin protocol. So going directly to prove now persistence and liveness, it's a difficult task. We need intermediate targets. We need to understand the data structure a bit more. <coughs> in order to be able to prove formally our final objective. For this reason, uh, in the TKL paper, as well as in follow-up work, 
by myself and Joe responding tacos. We introduced properties that could be used as intermediate goals that help one lay out arguments towards the objective of proving the ledger protocol uh, robust. These properties are a little bit closer to the data structure that is maintained by the parties. So observe that while persistence and liveness were referring to the ledger in a fairly abstract way, talking about blocks that are chronologically ordered, these properties now that we would introduce, they actually talk about the blockchain in a more intimate way. And there are the following three. Common prefix, chain quality, and chain growth. Common prefix informally says that if two players prove a sufficient number of blocks from their chains, they will obtain the same prefix. Chain quality states that any large enough chunk of an honest player's chain will contain some blocks from the honest player. And chain growth says that the chain of any honest player grows at least at a steady rate. We're going to call this the chain speed coefficient. I'll come next and give you exact definitions of those properties. Let's start with common prefix. So you can think of this as a convergence agreement type of property. Honest parties, during the execution of the protocol, they will disagree. Their views are going to be divergent. And when I say views now, I'm referring specifically to the data structure, which is the, data, the only state that they maintain as they execute the protocol. So you can think of the uh, view of the protocol as the concatenation of all these blockchains. And the question is, how different those individual views are. The common prefix property says that if you like take all this together and map them to a single one in let's say combined overlay view, the honest parties are going to have a uh, big common prefix and they're only going to disagree in the last few blocks. So here is the formal statement of this common prefix property. So this is the predicate that formally defines common prefix in an execution. It says, for all rounds, R1, R2, with R1 less or equal R2, and two parties, two honest parties, P1, P2, with two chains, what happens is that if we prove k blocks from chain C1, we will find ourselves into a prefix of chain C2. And I'm using this notation here for prefix. Prefix here should be understood in its literal string theoretic interpretation. So this version of common prefix, which I'm Stating here is a strong version of common prefix which we introduced with George Tony in 2016. Originally, the original version of common prefix was the same, but not requiring R1 to be less or equal to R2. So it was referring to the same round. This has a certain artifact in our presentation as we did not provide a black box reduction of persistence to the common prefix property, which is something that might be desirable from the aesthetical point of a mathematical presentation. In a nice work class, Seyman and Sela <coughs> highlighted this and proposed consistency to achieve a black box reduction, while at the same time we introduced this strong common prefix property 
you'll see the same black loss reduction, which is uh, a proof that I will be presenting to you today. <coughs> Chain quality. Are all these blocks going to be adopted by the farmers? So the chain quality property talks about the chain of one of the honest parties. It asks how many blocks are present from the parties running the protocol in the blockchain of an honest party. And specifically, it tries to balance the number of blocks that the adversary inserts in the blockchain to the blocks produced by the other partners. The chain quality property, which we introduced in the ZKL paper, has a parameter new, parameter k, and it says the proportion of blocks in any k long subsequence produced by the adversary should be less than mu times k. That's a subsequence of blocks, consecutive blocks, I should say, and the proportion of blocks produced by the adversary should be less than mu times k. New here on the terms should be a value between 0 and 1. And we expect that these values should somehow relate uh, to the adversarial hashing power, or at least so we hope. Finally, the chain growth observes the honest player's chain between two rounds. And it argues that the chain actually grows as the protocol execution advances. Specifically, it has another coefficient tau and an integer s. And it says, for all two rounds, an honest player p that has these two chains in those respective rounds, if the two rounds are sufficiently far apart, time-wise, then, the, then the chain of the party has grown by a certain amount, which is tau. So that's the speed of the chain. Property was introduced in K215, but it was implicitly present in TKL, but only in the form of a lemma as opposed to a separate property. So here is our proof target, and here's what I'm going to focus on for a good part of the remaining presentation. So this is the proof that the Bitcoin backbone is. Uh, a robust transaction ledger. First, we're going to define the notion of the typical execution, which is something which is going to be uh, extremely useful for probabilistic argue, for probabilistic arguing about the problem. Then, we're going to argue that typical executions happen, happen, I should say, with a one probability, and then we're going to prove chain growth, come prefix of chain quality. Using these three properties, then, we're going to derive resistance for those three properties and like this. So that's going to be a good chunk of the remaining of the presentation. And before the break, I hope I'll try to finish the first step, which is define what are typical executions, why they're important, and prove to you that they happen with over one complete. So as you remember, a lot of these, um, these properties that we're going to argue, they're going to be shown in a probabilistic sense. So let's take S to be a set of consecutive rounds. Let's define these three random particles, which we're going to use heavily um, in our proof structure. First one is X of S, which is the number of successful rounds. A successful round is a round that an honest party creates a block. That's called a successful round. Maybe more than one honest party creates a block. But that round is also successful. So here is a successful round. <coughs> Rounds that are not successful have the property that honest parties are silent. They're silent because they have nothing to say. They have produced nothing. So here is XS, the number of successful rounds. Another random variable which is important is called bias, is the number of uniquely successful rounds. Those are very interesting as well, and you can think of them as a more strict notion of a successful round. 
a uniquely successful round is a round where one party exactly <coughs> produced the block. X and Y are two random variables that have nothing to do uh, with the others. These only refer to the honest parties that we know exactly what they do. Z of S, on the other hand, is the total number of proofs of work that were computed during the sequence of round S by the adversary. So Z has to do with the adversary, X and Y with the honest parties. And observe that X is going to be bigger than Y. Now, why these random variables are important will become clear in the sequence of this analysis. Let's go a little bit deeper and understand exactly what's going on. Let's start with F, which is one of the most important parameters in this. It's the probability that at least one honest party finds a proof of work in a round. Given that the target is T, and let's say kappa here is the range of the hash function, around the oracle, the probability that nobody, none of the honest parties, finds a proof of work can be seen easily to be like this. The good thing here is that we are in the random oracle mode. And you can think that every time an honest party attempts to solve a proof of work, is essentially trying to put a ball in a basket. The probability of hitting the basket with the ball is like this. And this is the total number of attempts that the honest parties get collectively since they're executing the problem. One minus this is going to be the probability that at least one of them finds a proof of work. Let's call P to be Q over 2 kappa, just to avoid mentioning these two parameters all the time. And then we can do like a simple calculation to show that F is going to be equal to that. The good thing here is that we're going to be assuming to operate in a setting where t over 2 kappa is going to be sufficiently small and without loss of generality, I'm going to be equating f with this expression. What about the probability that exactly one party finds the <laughs> work? So exactly one party uh, finding a proof of work can be bounded in the following way. So here we have the probability again that one party finds a proof of work. So here is his chance. And like the, all the other parties fail. This is only a lower bound, an estimation. And we can further bound it from below in the following way. What is interesting here is that the probability that exactly one of this party finds a proof of work is quite related to uh, the values we had before, particularly f, but it has this 1 minus f in front of it. So basically this says that as f gets closer to 1, we're going to have a diminishing of this probability. And it will turn out that this is one of the uh, very important aspects um, of this analysis, the f value. And maintaining the f value, at the, choosing the f value at the appropriate point, is something that is critical for both resistance and lightness. And as we will see with a little bit foresight, f should not be too high or too small. <coughs> So let's now get back to these three random variables as I said, x, y, and z, and see what are its, their expectations. The nice thing is that they can be expressed with these uh, values which I've already introduced. That's expectation of x, that's the expectation of y, that's the expectation of z over a sequence of rounds s. So, an important assumption that is going to be recurring in our analysis is that a minus t over t is bigger than 1 plus delta. And you can imagine that this is a, a, a sort of an essentially honest majority assumption. We cannot have exactly 50% because none of our theorems would work like that. Um, 
But what we have to assume is that the honest parties divided by the number of malicious parties, they have an edge. And this edge is this delta, which could be a small real number, very close to zero. Once we make this assumption, we can extract this lower bounds for x and y. These lower bounds are extremely important. Why are they extremely important? Because they relate the expectation of x and the expectation of y with the expectation of z. Frequently, in the security proofs that you will see, there is going to be a tension between x and y. And things will be working in our favor if x and y manage to overcome z. So it's good that under this assumption, the expectation of x and y becomes bigger than z multiplied with certain factors that you see here. So let Kappa define the security parameter. And here is an introduction of what is a typical execution. So a typical execution is an execution where all these random variables x, y, and z are well behaved with respect to their mean. So an execution is called typical with parameter epsilon if for any set of rounds, consecutive rounds, that are sufficiently long, it happens that the x, y, z parameters are in this way related to their mean. Specifically, x is bigger than 1 minus epsilon its mean, y is bigger than 1 minus epsilon its mean, and z is smaller than 1 plus epsilon its mean. Notice that we have lower bounds for x and y and upper bounds for z. And these are multiplied with this epsilon factor. So that's a typical execution. And furthermore, Another aspect of being typical is that no, collection, no collisions or predictions take place against the hash function. A prediction is a special event for a hash function that says that you can predict the output of a hash function at the future round where the hash function is fed a highly random input. So this is the notion of a prediction which is also a low probability event, exactly like a collision. So, and I think I might be able to do this before we go on, on, on a break. <coughs> Typical executions happen almost always. So the thing is that if you start the protocol and you run an execution which is a random variable, I would argue that with overwhelming probability, and that's going to be in our security parameter kappa, our random variables are going to be well behaved and no collisions or predictions are going to happen. I'm going to focus on this uh, statement. And I'll argue to you that this is not very difficult to do. The good thing is that based on the way we have laid out the way the protocol works and uh, the operation of the honest parties and the adversary and the way they interact with the random oracle, X, Y, and Z are binomial distributions, are distributed according to the binomial. And therefore, what typicality asks are really concentration questions about three binomial random variables. The good thing is that we have a good tool for tail bounds of the binomial distribution called the term of bound, which you could see it's and you want, um, I think this is the um, negation uh, of the conditions of that slide. Uh, so say, suppose that you have a violation 
So the violation would be the existence of a sequence of consecutive rounds that either this happens, like x is not uh, it's too small, basically. The honest partners are unlucky in one or this way, or the other way is too lucky. Okay, so, so these are all binomial, and that means basically that they are far away from the mean. The good thing about binomial is, is that we have a tail bound, which is, which is um, very good. Um, and you can see it here. So if x of an odd distribution in mu is the mean, the Turn of bound states the following regarding deviations of the random variable from the mean, where delta here is a value between 0 and 1. So essentially, what the turn of bound tells you is that if you have a binomial, it looks like this. The turn of bound says that these tails, so called tails of the distribution, you can bound them. Their surface is exponentially bounded um, by this expression which relates to the mean. The big power of this is that in many common settings, including the one that we're describing here, for example, a binomial naturally arises as a sequence of n independent binomial trials that you sum them, for example, like sequence of n coin flips is a common example that are independent. Um, what happens is that the mean is n times p, where p is the probability of a single success. And the good thing is that this n is going to appear here at the exponent, which means that as n grows, the smaller, exponentially smaller, this bounds began. So how is this relevant for us? Is the fact that this value s here is going to be omega of kappa, and what happens in this turn of bound is that the means of all these variables, as you see, they are linear in S. So you see linear in S, <coughs> linear in S, linear in S. S is big omega of kappa, which means now that if you apply the turn of bound, we're going to get this value S here. It means that the bigger is the sequence of rounds, the closer to the mean you're going to find these three other variables. The nice thing about this notion of typicality, which is something that we developed as a proof strategy, not in the original uh, version of the paper, but as we studied the paper, as we studied the problem further the last few years, um, is that it's able to pack the probabilistic argument into a single state. The benefit of this is that I will not have to return to a probabilistic argument in the remaining of the security. All my probability, sort of all my probability requirements and needs are packed into this typicality argument and now conditioning on a typical execution. I am guaranteed that everything is going to be sufficiently well behaved. And from that point on, in the second part of the talk, I will go on to the proof, which is not going to use probability anymore but just combinatorial arguments about how the protocol advances. So I'll stop here and have a break, right? Is that yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, in this second part of this lecture, I'll uh, <coughs> we covered Number one and two here. What is a typical execution and are the typical executions happening for women? In this second part, we're going to start going to the properties chain growth, common prefix, chain quality. And then we're going to derive persistence matches. So this will complete um, the uh, security proof that the Bitcoin backbone protocol is a robust transaction ledger. And after that, I'm just going to start discussing extensions of our model and also questions for future work. Okay, so let's start with common prefix. It's by far is the most difficult property of the field. 
So let's recall the definition. Common prefix says that for any two rounds, R1 is only for R2, two parties, P1, P2, that are acting in these rounds will change C1, C2. It happens that if we prune K blocks from chain C1, we're going to find ourselves in a prefix of C2. Observe that there is no requirement here that P1, P2 is different. So it could be that we're talking about the same part. Now, one party, one party is changed, evolves over time. That's why this universal quantifier like, also applies to P1, P2. So the proof is going to be by contradiction. So let's imagine a situation where what we postulate it doesn't hold. And let's examine it. We have these two rounds, R1 or 2, R1 being less or equal than R2. And we have two chains, C1 and C2, present in this round, in the individual view of party P1 and party P2. And what happens is that chain C1, you see here, has diverged from chain C2. The last common block has a timestamp R0. And what happens is that there are more than k blocks here because we are in violation of this condition. And if we prune k blocks from C1, we will not find ourselves to a prefix of C2. So there's more than k blocks in this part. So this is a violation of, uh, of the problem. So let's take the last honest block that has a timestamp R star. And it's in the common prefix of C1, C2. Observe that this may not be this one. It could be the case that this block that you see here is an adversarial block. This block could be the genesis block. So it could be the case that there is absolutely no block that these two chains have in common, apart from the genesis <coughs> Nevertheless, we do assume that all valid chains, they have the same genesis block. And therefore, uh, this block is well defined. Now, let's define this other round R, which lies in between R1 and R2. And let's define it in the following way. This is the first round, bigger than equal R1, where an honest party has a chain C2 prime that diverges from that if you prune C1 in K blocks from C1, you're not going to be in a prefix of C2 prime. So this round is well defined. The reason it's well defined is that R2, party P2 with chain C2, is an example that fits that definition. Of course, it may not be the first one. So there might be many other rounds preceding round R2 that have the same property. We have the same divergence condition. We certainly know there's one. And, and there's one that's going to happen between R1 and R2. And let's call this R. So now we're going to um, consider the sequence of rounds starting from R star up to R. This sequence of rounds are going to have a special function for us in this security argument. We would like to be able to argue that this period from R star to R is going to be sufficiently long for us to apply um, elements of uh, arguments that we had when we described about typical uh, execution. For this reason, we have to assume that from R star to R, 
there's going to be a sufficient amount of time that has passed. This will be ensured by <coughs> stating that K is omega of kappa, where kappa is the security part. And this K is how many blocks you're proving. So this will also imply with a relatively easy argument that there is some time that has passed from R star to R, certainly because a certain number of blocks have been produced in, in sequence in this, in this part of the Now let's go and have a look at what happens at round R minus 1, which is the round immediately preceding round R. So round R is the special round where an honest party gets that chain C2 prime, which diverges from C1. Just a little bit, think about it intuitively. What happened here, let's say before round R, it could have been the case that all honest parties were happily living in chain C1. And there was no divergence at all. It could have been the case, not necessarily, but it could have been. So at round R minus 1, things were, let's say, not divergent. And then something happens from round R minus 1 to round R, and a divergence occurs for at least one of the honest parties. It could be the case for all of them, but there is at least one honest party that will diverge. So at round R minus 1, all parties have this chain, CI R minus 1, let's say. Party PI has such a chain, and all of them are consistent, perhaps extending chain C1. So C1 through K will be a prefix of the chains that the parties have in this round. Nevertheless, at the end of the round R minus 1, there is a chain C2 prime that is transmitted for which we know the following. It violates the prefix condition. So C1 prune K is not a prefix of C2 prime anymore. That's by definition. And furthermore, the chain C2 prime cannot be a short chain. It has to be at least as long as C1. To see that, observe that what happens is that at round R, at least one honest party will accept chain C2 prime. And we know that at round R, which is at least R1, there is an honest party that possesses chain C1. So since there is an honest party that possesses C1 at round R1, at round R, it means that at least one honest party, P1, for example, has accepted a chain which is that long. So it cannot be the case that another chain acceptable by another party, by another honest party, uh, at this round is going to be shorter than that. Because parties do choose chains um, according to how long they are. And they don't adopt chains that are short. So this is a key point. This chain C2 prime, which is accepted by an honest party at round R, it's at least as long as C1. So let's look at the situation that we have now. We have this round R, where this chain C2 prime that diverges from C1 has been introduced. And we have this at, at round R minus 1, chain C1, and perhaps other chains that fork from it here at the end, these are all where the honest parties are. But then suddenly at round R, one honest party moves from uh, this set of chains to here, introducing a fork. By the way, you observe that C2 prime may or may not be equal to the chain C2, which is the one I postulated in the beginning. But this is, doesn't hurt the security argument. Okay. The existence of C2 prime is derived from the fact that C2 exists, but it doesn't have to be the same chain. So it could be very well that this chain C2, that P2 ended up with at round R2, is a different chain 
than say true crime, this is not really of concern. What is of concern is that both C2 and C2 prime diverge from C1. Uh, even um, more than K-box. Like. So let's examine this sequence of rounds. We start at round R star, or let's say R star plus one, then the next round after that, and go up to round R minus one. And we will try now to measure how many blocks are present in these rounds and where were they were produced. Let's take a uniquely successful round among those. Here is a first key observation, a key level that can be derived from the way the protocol works. If there is a block that is created in a uniquely successful round at a position M in the blockchain, when I say position, I mean this is the nth block of that chain. Then no other honest player will ever mine at position M in any blockchain. Let me convince you that this is the case. In a uniquely successful round, we have an interesting situation where an honest party has a chain which apparently is n minus one blocks, because the uniquely successful round will produce a block in the other position. And an honest party found a block just one honest party was successful. That's why it's uniquely successful. So all the other parties failed to extend their chains, independently of where they are. But that honest party found the block. The moment the party finds, finds a block in a round, it transmits it. So it will become available to all the other parties in the next chain, in the next round. So what is going to happen? The parties that are behind, let's say, at, with change of length n minus 1, or even short, will see the chain with n blocks and will adopt. Whereas the parties that are already ahead, who knows, because perhaps of adversarial interference <coughs> with their blockchain, they will just ignore it. No matter what, in the next round, nobody is going to be mining at position M. Everybody is going to be moving ahead. So, if a block is created, <coughs> it is successful round in the position M in the blockchain. No other honest player will mine that position in the box. So this creates an interesting challenge for the actors. And it's like a core argument for this security. Every uniquely successful round in the sequence of round S creates a block that should be matched by a block of the actors. So specifically, if there is a uniquely successful round here that creates a block, for the adversary to maintain the four condition, he has to produce and match that block that is produced by another. Because there is no way at position N in these two chains to have two blocks from honest part. Uniquely successful rounds produce blocks that the adversary has to match if he is to hope to maintain the fork running. So this creates a condition and creates a challenge for the adversary that he has to make blocks 
at least at the rate of rounds that are uniquely successful. <coughs> so this is the first key observation for this example. So how old can these blocks? That's the next critical lemma. Because it could be the case, let's say, that the adversary at the beginning of time makes a big bag of blocks. And he keeps them and sprinkles them at some particular region that are uniquely successful rounds and they are of interest, it is of interest to the adversary and matches them. So the second key observation of this proof is that these adversarial blocks should be created within the period S of rounds. Why is that? Going back and remind you, the definition of S was from R star to R. There was a reason I extended back and I reached to the first honest block at time R star. What is the value of the first honest block in this sequence? Is the fact that this honest block has entropy that was introduced to the protocol by an honest party. Therefore, and in the random oracle assumption, due to the typicality of the execution, we said no predictions can happen. Therefore, any proofs of work produced by the adversary preceding round R star will not be useful because the adversary cannot hope to be lucky and predict a hash value which was produced by honest parties proof of work. So this is the second critical observation that the adversarial blocks that are going to be used to match the uniquely successful rounds should be produced within the period of rounds S and not before. So these are the two critical lemmas that make this security argument work. Now that we've laid it out, we're ready to do the final step of the proof. Because matching should take place, Z of S should be bigger than equal Y of S. Because remember, recall, Z is the number of proofs of work, the number of blocks produced by the adversary in the sequence of rounds S. And Y is the number of uniquely successful rounds. Each one of them produces a block. And the adversary has to match them all within that sequence of rounds S. We have that we selected S to be at least omega of kappa because there is at least k blocks produced in the sequence of rounds S and k was selected to be omega of kappa and therefore typicality can apply and what typicality tells us is that we have a lower bound for Ys and an upper bound for Zs which we're now going to combine with this inequality. Essentially what's happening is that this is going to be a violation. We don't expect something like this to happen in a typical execution. Recall that the expectation of Y is at least that, and that's the expectation of X. The expectation of Z is that, and we have this requirement regarding the number of honest parties and the number of malicious parties. By doing a substitution, this is the expectation of Z times 1 plus epsilon. This is here. This is Z of S, which is bigger than Y of S. And y of S is bigger than 1 minus epsilon, the expectation of Y of S, which we can bound from here and there. Finally, this produces this inequality, which if you do the calculation, you will obtain an upper bound for n minus t over t, which has terms that have to do only with two things. The error of typicality, which is the one also that um, is related to our turn of bound argument, 
and one minus f. Where f, remember, is the probability that one round is successful. So n minus t over t should be less than that, while we have postulated that n minus t over t is bigger than that. And therefore, by choosing delta so in a way that 1 plus delta is bigger than that, we're going to get a contradiction. To achieve that, delta should be, I mean, this will be implied by choosing delta to be bigger than 2 epsilon plus delta. And this is um, uh, a how much more should be the ratio of the honest parties versus the adversary. Mm -hmm. Observe that n is present here, and this is a. This suggests that we would like to choose f as small as possible if we are to choose delta as small as possible. I mean, by this, observe that we want delta to be close to zero so that we are close to 50%. And, and, and thus, f should be. However, that would only be for common prefix, as you will see. Um, Liveness would ask us to choose f not to school. And therefore, finding the right f is going to be an interplay between resistance and liveness at the end. Yes, John? So, uh, your, the proof here just uh, assumed on the majority, right? You felt as small as possible. How does that fit with the self uh, self mind of um, it's actually orthogonal, if you want. So Celsius mining will manifest, will manifest itself in the next, uh, in the next proof. Because Celsius mining itself does not concern sort of the divergence of the proxies, but rather the quality of the contents. Okay, so mining seems to give the attacker a way to force the chain arbitrarily wrong. No, it's not about it's not about forking the chain in selfish mining. It's about the forking that happens in, in selfish mining is not done as an attempt to make the honest parties split, but it is in an attempt to make honest parties adopt adversarial blocks. So it will be very clear when I come to the next proof. So this is the end of this proof um, that establishes common practice. Going right ahead to chain work. Consider a chain of an honest partner and L consecutive blocks from that chain. We're going to prove, we're going to establish chain work. And chain quality, as you remember, it uh, has a coefficient, chain quality coefficient, nu, which is an upper bound on the portion of the blocks that the adversary can insert in an honest parties chain. So, so this is uh, nu. And we're going to prove that nu is 1 over lambda where lambda is an arbitrary parameter that satisfies this. Observe now that I've strengthened the majority of the um, honest party by this lambda coefficient, which is some value closer than, uh, bigger than one, but as close to one as possible, again. Here, basically, this says and you can also detect a little bit the weakness of this chain quality theorem, the fact that the number of blocks that are controlled by the adversary are going to be approximating 100% as the adversary is going to be um, coming close to uh, majority. So basically, the closer the adversary comes to majority, there's going to be absolutely no chain because they're going to be controlling basically all the blocks. 
Still, we're going to show that this little chain quality exists is sufficient for many applications. So this answers the concern right, uh, about this parameter in the, the previous question. So let's go by contradiction. Consider a sequence of blocks, V, U, V, V, which are of that length. And this exists in a chain of you know, star. Let's augment that sequence of blocks. Let's augment it to uh, a slightly larger sequence so that BU prime was produced by an honest party at round, let's say, R1, whereas BV prime was accepted by an honest party at round R2. So that's a slight extension of the original block segment, which is going to be convenient for us because we want to anchor that chain to blocks that were actually possessed by honest partners. Observe that such extension is well defined. Um, for example, BU prime, if all else fails, can be the genesis block, whereas BV prime can be the current head of the chain, because that's a segment of a chain that is possessed by a honest partner. Let's x call the number of blocks that are produced by the honest parties. And let's say for the sake of contradiction, let's say if x is less than 1 minus mu times l. So in other words, the adversary controls more than a portion mu of that original segment. With a similar argument as we did before, we can argue again here that because of the typicality of the execution, all the L blocks of that chain, of that segment of the chain, were produced in this sequence of rounds. And this again invokes the fact that no predictions happen in a typical execution. And therefore the blocks, the blocks that, that we have here in that sequence of rounds, they are going to be blocks produced during the period of round R1 up to R2. The second lemma which is relevant is that because the way we chose S, the length of the expanded segment, capital L, is bigger equal to X over S. Why is that the case? Let me try to convince you about that. X of S is the number of successful rounds. So this is the minimum rate, if you want, that the honest parties change grow, no matter what is the strategy of the adversary. Every uniquely success every excuse me, every successful round X will add the block to the honest parties chain, no matter what the adversary does. Observe, this does not guarantee that the block is going to be honest by the adversary. But the point is that if you have a successful round, the parties, the honest parties, are going to be rushing forward without the adversary enabling them, enabling, well, without enabling the adversary to hold them back. The only thing the adversary can do, possibly, is issue another block of its own creation. But the honest parties change will grow. And that's a key point. So this capital L is going to be bigger than equal X, because otherwise, no honest party would have accepted BV prime. And we are sure that BV prime was accepted by honest party at this point. So with this key observation, and our assumption about x, we can find another inequality between z and x. So z of s, which is the number of blocks produced by the adversary, should be at least l minus x, because this is the number of blocks of that segment we study, and these are x is the blocks produced by the first part. L minus X, by the assumption, is bigger than mu times L. That's because X are not that many. And by lemma number two here, this is bigger than X plus. 
What is relevant for us is z bigger than mu x. Yes. Uh, z is, uh, as the bar is exactly the same then yeah. So basically, Z could be all the blocks the adversary produced. Be because the point here is that because of typicality, all the blocks that we are currently considering, they are created within that period of time. So therefore, the adversary is under stress, let's say, to match that number because he has to insert all those blocks there. Does that, does that make sense? So basically, we have absolutely no restriction about where the adversary is mining. He could be mining, you know, anywhere. And if he's smart enough, he would be mining at sensible places. But ultimately, here, this is a counting argument. It's not actually an argument that says, where did the adversary mount? But the shield volume of the blocks that the adversary has produced and argue has to be at least that much. Which in turn has to be at least that much. And that's good now, because now we can turn to a similar argument, like the one that we used in the common prefix in the end of the common prefix proof. Invoke typicality and the closeness to the means of these random variables and derive a contradiction. <coughs> so, we have that z is bigger than mu times x, and the number of rounds s is at least omega kappa. Because of typicality, we have these two conditions. x is bigger than 1 minus epsilon the mean, z is less than 1 plus epsilon the mean. We're going to again take these two and use them in conjunction to this inequality. At the same time, we're going to recall the definition of the means. That's the mean of x, lower bound for the mean of y, and z, as well as the condition we have on the number of other parties versus the number of other side of parties. Doing the substitution, I'm starting from this side. 1 plus epsilon times the mean of z, which I have it from here. I'm substituting this, and I'm obtaining this side. So that's equal to this. In turn, that's bigger than that. That's bigger than equal to this. And this x is bigger than this. So now I'm doing the substitution for the expectation of x, which is approximately that. And this will give me this expression. So using that inequality, I can now obtain an upper bound on n minus p over t. And you will see that by doing the calculation, I've designed everything so that I will be get a I will be getting a contradiction as long as one plus delta is bigger than that. Which can be implied by choosing delta to be two over x. Please. Don't be deceived by the fact that this is now better than the common prefix, because I've also introduced now, for my convenience, this multiplicative factor lambda, which actually b is a value bit bigger than lambda, and, and is actually making things, it introduces more tension here. Um, you may ask, so this is the completion of that proof for um, chain quality coefficient 1 over lambda. You might ask, first of all, you might you will observe that this is not very, very nice. Like, I mean, in fact, we would have preferred um, that um, the, 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 this coefficient was, was closer to um, t over n minus t, or closer to, um, or I should say, t over n, like proportional to how many adversarial parties we have in the system. Unfortunately, it is not. Then you can ask, is that an artifact of, of this proof? Like, is this proof not, let's say, tight, and, and we can improve it? Unfortunately, no. There is a strategy, a block, so-called block withholding strategy, akin to a selfish mining strategy, which actually matches this part. And therefore, there's nothing we can do, at least within this model, 
where the adversary is rushing and controls the network. There's nothing we can do to improve that location. And, and we have to live it. So we have to see what we can get uh, with, with that, let's say, rather small chain. Just to understand how small it is, just imagine that as the adversary approaches 50% in hashing power, the ratio of blocks from the adversary will be overwhelming in any sufficiently long segment of the honest parties chain. So the honest parties will be barely managing on just a few blocks like as the, as the chain advances. Now I have to question the other way. Yeah. Uh, selfish mining only claims it works above one third. Well, we are in a uh, setting where rushing adversary in adversarial network conditions. So basically, it's a it's a stronger model, and, and, and therefore um, we have like a better attack, which is actually simpler than underwinding the solar mine subtlety. And we articulated that um, that attack in the GK paper, so it's you can um, see there the optimality is is quite uh, easy. Okay, so finally chain growth. Um, so let's consider a chain of an honest party. Um, and I'm going to show to you that the chain growth coefficient is 1 minus epsilon times f. Um, so basically, this is how fast the chain will grow. And as you see now, f here makes its second appearance. And now it makes it from the flip side. We wanted f to be very small for a common prefix to be closer to honest majority. <laughs> Here you will see that we would like f to be not so small. Because if we make it, let's say, very close to zero, then the speed, the chain growth coefficient, is going to be basically zero, and the chain will not be growing. And as you will see, we want the chain to grow, because based on chain growth, we're going to prove finally uh, resistance and lightness. Um, direct proof. Observe that any successful round, the chain of the honest part is grows by a block. I already argued that in lemma one in the chain quality. Same quality. Um, and it comes directly from the way that the um, big point backbone is, is defined. Um, so if you take a number of rounds, let's say S, the expectation of the successful rounds are that many. And this is like the minimum rate that the honest parties change will grow. Observe that it may grow faster, because let's say the adversary decides to play honestly and participate in this. But the worst thing they can do against chain growth is like not do anything at all. So in that case, we'll minimize uh, the growth of the chains. Now, due to typicality again, x of s is, has this relation to its mean. And therefore, in a period of s rounds, we will obtain that many blocks, which is 1 minus epsilon times f times s. And this is a direct proof that the chain growth coefficient so I left this easiest proof as the last one with me. Um, because now, with these three properties of the data structure, chain quality, common prefix, and chain growth, uh, we are ready to prove our objective, which is the Bitcoin backbone implements a robust transaction ledger. The assumptions that we're going to use is that there are typical executions with error epsilon. We have this delta value, which is 2 epsilon plus f, at least that big. That controls this 1 plus delta coefficient. And also we have this lambda, which is close to 1. And this value f is pt times n minus 3. And we're going to assume, even though it's not written in that slide, that this value f is somewhere between 0 and 1. Not too small, not too big. So that's the assumptions for the final theorem to go. So first, we're going to prove persistence. We're going to go by contradiction. Assume persistence fails. <coughs> Let's call a bit what resistance, what, what does that mean? There is a transaction that is um, reported as stable at, by an honest party at round R1. This is like misplaced here. So that's like an honest party P1 reporting a transaction as stable at round R1. But then, another round, R2, maybe bigger than R1, the same transaction is reported stable by an honest player, P2, 
Maybe the same as P1, but maybe different, but now it's in a different position. So given this condition, what happens is that the change of C1, the change C1 and C2 in the two particles should satisfy that if I prune K blocks from C1, the transaction TX will be present, that happened at round R1. Whereas if I prune K blocks from C2, transaction TX is going to be present here, but it's going to be in a different position. This means that C1 chop K Pruning K block from C1 is not a com is not a prefix of C2. That's because transactions cannot be repeated and so So this is used here. Um, I haven't mentioned it, but these transactions have to be unique. So you cannot accept the same transaction twice in the ledger. And that's needed here to finally argue that. So this is a direct violation of the common prefix property, and therefore resistance was reduced black box common prefix in this very, very simple, simple slide. Let's go to Leibniz. So Leibniz asks the following. If you try to insert a transaction in the letter for a sufficient number of rounds, if you weight this number of rounds in U, um, <coughs> you'll see that everyone is going to call it state. So it's going to be adopted by everyone's chain, every party in their blockchain is going to be sufficiently varied um, with K blocks. So let's examine what happens at the next round after we transmit it for you rounds. Because of chain growth and the fact that we waited for U blocks, there's going to be at least tau times u blocks in each honest party chain, where tau here is the chain growth coefficient. Furthermore, by chain quality, 1 minus 1 over lambda, where 1 over lambda here is the coefficient of chain quality, will be due to an honest part. Given the choice of u, you can do the substitution and you can bound by one this value, which means that after U rounds, there's going to be at least one <coughs> block coming from an honest part in the chain of every honest part. And what's good now is that that's enough because we are attempting to insert that transaction for U consecutive rounds. And at least one block was produced by an honest party, and therefore that honest party had this transaction in its pool of transactions for insertion to the blockchain, and therefore that transaction made it some in the blockchain. So this is the final proof that the Bitcoin backbone protocol implements a robust transaction ledger. Observe. The parameters here, and especially this parameter for Leibniz has f in the denominator, and therefore, like we would choose f to be too small, we're going to have to wait longer for the next for the network to call the transaction um, state. At the same time. F is involved here, the delta should be bigger than it, so we'd like it to be small, um, so that we're not too far away from our majority. So this creates a natural tension um, between the transaction processing speed and, and the security of uh, the protocol, which can now, based on all this modeling work, can be studied in a formal way. All right, so with this, let me come now to applications. And obviously, our, you know, the first thing you can think about, and this is also the first thing that we try to look at when we were working on this in the GKL paper, is um, to 
understand how does this relate to consensus. And can you use that protocol? Can you use this blockchain protocol to solve consensus? I mean, this was the first natural question. I mean, and, and it sounded like it shouldn't be, should be easy, but it turns out it's not. It's not easy, actually. It's not safe for to solve consensus by uh, using this protocol. And that was a little bit surprising <coughs> to me when I was uh, starting to understand this problem better. Um, exactly because there's so much um, confusion about what is consensus and what is the blockchain achieving. There's a lot of mix, mix ups about the terminology uh, when people talk about these problems. Nevertheless, so keep in mind that consensus is a well defined problem with a long history uh, in, in, in computer science literature, and even though it has many versions, many variants of it, um, this variant is, um, is the one that people identify with. <coughs> so we already defined this, so how we can solve it? So I guess the idea is like, can we apply the backbone protocol? Like, you remember that like, we had this predicates, the validity predicate, the input function, and the read function, and maybe we can define like the blockchain in a certain way so that it can be used as a way to solve consensus. So basically here is a reduction. Can we use the blockchain, the Bitcoin backbone, by specifying only the validity predicate, the input function, and the read function, and then like solve consensus using the properties of persistence and life in the Hopefully that, that, that is. Actually, Nakamoto himself was aware of this. And he was aware that consensus is a different problem. Or at least, he didn't call it consensus, but he referred to it as Byzantine generals, which um, actually is it's a close variant, where usually people refer to consensus is the Byzantine agreement problem. But he was aware of it. And he actually tried to argue that you can use the blockchain to solve consensus or business in general problems in a direct way. So that was actually a post that not many people know about. It's coming from 13 of November 2008. And this is, in this post, Nakamoto describes a way to use the blockchain to prove uh, to derive consensus. Um, because apparently, um, it was also felt at the time that there must be a relationship between the two problems. And it should be the case that the blockchain like, solves consensus in some way. So you can uh, go to this link and read exactly his description, which uh, nicely fits to our framework. So basically, the protocol described, which I will call the model consensus protocol, and I would like you in your mind to differentiate from the blockchain, because this is the protocol that solves consensus in the classical definition of what consensus means, and not blockchain. His protocol is something that uh, can be described um, easily with this machinery that I've introduced to you um, in this work. So basically, and here I'm giving the full description, but I'll just describe it to you in a high level, it's quite simple. We have to define, in order to use the backbone protocol, we have to define V, I, and R. So we have to define what does it mean for change to be valid. We have to define how do we insert inputs to the blockchain, and how do we interpret the blockchain, which is R. So in this Nakamoto consensus protocol, um, I can describe it in the backbone model as follows. The predicate V accepts only blockchains which are very simple. They are completely empty of anything else except a single input value, which is either 0 or 1. Because we, you remember, we're solving consensus in the binary case. The inputs of the parties are 0. So basically what happens is that the parties try to make blockchains that have their input inside. And in every block, they put their own input. So if you have 0, you try to make a blockchain which is 0, 0, 0. You have a one, you try to make a blockchain which is one, one, one. That's all. So, how does the protocol advance? What happens is that you run this protocol for a certain number of rounds, and let's say once you reach a certain number of rounds, all parties terminate, 
look at their blockchain, and that is just the output, the single bit that they see there. What happens is that they will all agree because of common preference. And all blockchains or valid blockchains have either all zero or all one. So you can easily see that um, persistence here and common preference if they want, as the two problems are very close to each other, uh, would imply agreement. Unfortunately, this protocol will not give you validity with hyperplane. And this is a deficiency of that protocol idea. The reason is that very simple. Suppose all parties start with 8.0, and the adversary is likely to be the first one who uses it. Puts one inside there, then all the honest parties follow the backup protocol, we switch to that chain, and then continue. So they started from zero, then they switch to one, and this happens with non mechanism protocol. So this is not a um, overwhelming probability, and that, therefore, we call this a consensus protocol, but not quite. Because a consensus protocol should provide you all the properties with overwhelming protocol. So that was a bit of a disappointment. Um, we thought that it should be easier to do it. So, so we tried to follow it like a different approach, which provides a consensus protocol that works for up to one third. I'll just describe you this protocol. Again, very simple to describe by defining V, R, and I the three functions that determine what should be inside the blockchain, how do we determine the input to the blockchain, and how do I interpret the blockchain. This protocol, which is um, the first protocol from the GKL, the first consensus protocol from the GKL paper, works like this. It's very similar to the proposal of Nakanova, but now you don't change you don't change the input you try to insert inside the blockchain. You say, I started with an input bit, let's say zero, and every block I produce will have zero. Maybe now the chain has both zeros and one. It's a mixture of zeros and one. But I'm gonna keep trying, I'm gonna keep insisting on my input. Whenever I get a block, I put a zero if my input was zero. Or I put a one if it was a one. Now, now, this will create blockchains, which are, they have both zeros and ones in their blocks. So how do we get agreement? The protocol will work in the following way. We're going to continue expanding the blockchain, and at a certain moment, we're going to stop. Now we would like to invoke common prefix. We're going to choke K blocks from the end of the chain. We're going to look at the initial prefix of our chain, and then, Observe, we have both zeros and ones in that initial prefix. We're going to output the majority bit. Will this work? Well, it will work as long as the honest parties, they have the majority of the blocks. Unfortunately, we know that this is not true in general. That's because of chain quality. Chain quality does not guarantee that the honest parties will produce the majority of the blocks inside the blockchain. And it could be the case that the honest parties uh, started with zero, but they end up with a chain that has a big common prefix that is full of ones, and therefore running majority of will switch their input bits from 0 to 1. And such an attack is possible because of block <coughs> There is a way to match that. Is this protocol useless though? No. There is a way to make this protocol work. And chain quality again gives us the answer. If you look at the bound that we have, which is 1 over lambda, it says the following. What if lambda is 2? Basically, this means that the number of honest parties is twice as many as the bad parties, as the malicious parties. So we are in a situation we are one third per side of power. Then, chain quality ensures that the majority of the blocks in any segment are going to be coming from honest parties. And therefore, if you run majority at the end of this, you're going to get 
um, the correct fit. So this was, this came to us with a bit of mixed feelings. Um, we had a, we, we have shown that you can use the blockchain protocol to get consensus. Um, but it was one third, and somehow this was diverging from our understanding that we should get like an honest majority. Because after all, we have shown that um, it works for honest majority, at least with respect to the transaction ledger. And in fact, we went to describe fully how you can use the backbone to implement an abstract transaction ledger. Maybe not necessarily one, um, uh, not necessarily one that is like Bitcoin, but any transaction ledger. And there, when you have transactions that are based on digital signatures, there's certain care you have to apply when you prove persistence and liveness, specifically about liveness, which now, beyond <coughs> the conditions which I mentioned already to you in uh, uh, the beginning of this lecture, we also need digital signature security to prove liveness. The reason is rather simple. Uh, if digital signature security fails, the adversary can make a forgery of one of your transactions and then this can uh, hurt the liveness uh, guarantee. It doesn't hurt the persistence. So with this, we have a complete treatment at the abstract level that the backbone protocol implemented a transaction ledger which satisfied persistence and liveness for sort of any type of transaction that um, you would want. At least those that are useful um, all the cases that we knew. But is it possible now? Yeah. Can you go back to the slide? Yeah. So how do you prove agreement here? So, I mean, I'm worried that you know, the, two, the, uh, the blockchain, you know, maybe uh, one more than the you know, majority, maybe one more, and then by going K back, you may be able to change with the majority. Right. So the point here is that you would like, you would argue uh, agreement as follows. First of all, you like the chain to grow a lot. And um, so this has to extend it um, up to at least, um, let's say, 2K, where K is a parameter. Then by chopping K blocks, you guarantee that the honest part is they have K blocks at the beginning. And by common prefix, is the same sequence. Of oh, I didn't know that you're taking the majority of uh, the one in the first K. Now. Yes. Oh, okay. So that's essential, uh, otherwise you, you would run into this. So first you chop K-blocks, then you take majority, and then by chain quality, one-third, you guarantee that the majority is, is there. Okay, so we were poised to find a way to argue consensus um, based on the blockchain, but it was clear that something else was needed. The reason was that chain quality was not allowing us to create sufficiently many blocks. So all these like majority arguments that, that we could take was uh, a deal. And then it came like something that you might imagine as a natural. Why don't we use proof of work also for the transactions themselves, like the things that you insert in the blockchain? After all, proof of work is what you can use to reflect honest majority in the messages that you exchange in, in such a system. So, instead of using proof of work to construct the blockchain itself, let's also use proof of work for the transactions themselves. So, this suggested like the following protocol, which looks similar to the previous protocol that we designed, but now it's enhanced and the transactions which basically contain your input are not just your input but proofs of work with respect to your input. Then we use the same idea pretty much. Once the blockchain is long enough, the parties will prove the last k-blocks and output the majority of the unique values that are drawn from the set of transactions in the ledger. 
So now, because of proof of work, we are hoping to argue that the honest parties will not be hindered by the fact that chain quality is low. Even a single block, as we have proven, is enough for all the honest transactions to be inserted. Assuming, of course, we don't have bounds on how many transactions you include uh, in one block. Right? Because if you have, of course, then that will be a an issue, but you could still calibrate this by allowing the protocol to run sufficiently. So we're very excited when this realization came in, that actually we can use proof of work in two ways. But then immediately realized that there is a big pitfall here. Now, proofs of work are used in, for two different tasks. How do we assure that honest majority is, prefer, is preserved in both? We cannot just naively say that the honest parties will spend half of their queries for the one task and the other half for the other. I mean, of course, the honest parties might do that, because they're honest after all, but the adversary may not. And of course, we will not be able to um, do the proof argument in the way I am doing This was actually, at the same time, quite interesting. It's one of these composition problems that um, frequently happen in, in cryptography, when you try um, to take protocols that you understand their security properties individually and you try to bring them together. On the one side, we had the blockchain protocol, which we had completely understood uh, in terms of its security properties. And then we had like a simple protocol that was creating proof of work inputs and transmitting them. So these were two protocols that in isolation worked for honest majority. So the blockchain protocol worked for honest majority with both persistence and blindness. And that was enough for our proof. The other protocol also worked um, because it was honest majority. The majority of proof of work inputs would be originating from the honest parties. So in isolation, both protocols work well. And if somehow we could bring them together and have their properties preserved, we would have our consensus protocol based on the blockchain. Um, that worked with honest majority. And unfortunately, it was not obvious how to do it. We needed some way to compose um, these two protocols, these two proof of work protocols together. So this came to uh, this idea in the GKL paper that managed this composition. We called it uh, two for one pass, two for one proof of work. And it's like, um, it's like an idea how you can get two for proofs of work for the price of the quality. Let me try to explain this, this uh, concept, which uh, essentially enables the parallel composition of two proof of work based protocols while preserving their security properties. Um, so imagine that you have two um, proof of work style protocols, which are like Bitcoin style. So they have some H value, which is produced by hash function Z, contains maybe some previous hash mind and an x value of inputs and then you have uh, the physical proof of work if it's less than the target so that's the yellow protocol and then the green protocol does the same and you would like honest parties to multiplex to run these protocols in parallel so they have like two every honest party will have like two threads and they're going to be doing this at the same time so for example in the i'm presenting this generally but you can easily apply it in the, in the previous case. So in the previous case, um, you can think like the yellow protocol is the, so let's say, blockchain protocol, and the green protocol is the one that produces uh, proofs of work for all your, uh, for the input value that you have. Um, so um, then when you get some SX CDR, um, you do this verification and you accept it if that's the case. And similarly, you verify the other case. So that's verification. Um, if you just take two threads and run them together, it won't work. So the security uh, cannot be added. So it's not secure. So here is here is our, our idea for a two for one proof of work. This composability idea, let's say limited composability uh, for two problems. So 
what you do is the following. Um, so you can think of this as the yellow or green color, because now that you, uh, this is a non-black box type of composition, you have to meld the two protocols together. So the protocol works like this. You are getting this hash value as before from the yellow and the green protocol. And now you create a single W, which is instead of this value, and instead of that value, you get a single W value, which is the hash of both the yellow and the green um, H value. And now you do the following. If this value W is less than T, you call this a proof of work solution for the yellow. On the other hand, if this value, you turn it around, you reverse the string, and you find that it is less than T prime, you call this a proof of work for the green problem. And now you have to do verification in some sort of combined way. Because now, when you find a proof of work, every time a proof of work for the yellow protocol will have some green protocol artifacts that you ignore, and the proof of work for the green protocol will have some yellow protocol artifacts that you also ignore. This does not affect verification. The key point is that by doing this trick, you attempt to disassociate the proof of work operation and essentially try to get two proofs of work for the price of one. Observe that the number of queries that the honest party performed will still be the same. So you will not divide Q over two queries for yellow and Q over two for green. You do Q green yellow queries and you will count them as solutions to yellow or the green protocol depending on whether the hash value is going to be too small or too big. What we need to show for the composition to work is that these events are independent of each other. Because if they're not independent, then the composition will not work. Luckily, we're doing an analysis in the <coughs> model. And therefore, um, as long as the T and T prime are sufficiently properly selected, uh, we can do we can get this length. So finding power, the power solution for either side of the power protocol is going to be the dependent event. And that should be a suitable choice for the prime. For example, like powers of two for this. So by no means this is the only way you can do this. So this is an, an idea. And it's kind of an interesting question whether you can compose more protocols together and how far you can go. Um, doing this li limited composability uh, step. So here is the TKL consensus protocol, our final version. So <coughs> parties will mine proofs of work for each block, as in the Bitcoin backbone. They will then mine proofs of work for each input as well. So they, cre they create a blockchain, and then they insert their input repetitively, solving fresh proofs of work. So every time they get a proof of work for the input, they broadcast it, and at the same time, they do the blockchain protocol using this two for one proof of work. After the blockchain grows sufficiently, they chop the last k blocks and now they return the majority among the unique inputs in their common traffic. Now, based on the fact that now all the inputs have proof of work, it is guaranteed that there's going to be an honest majority. And now, finally, using this idea, we can prove our main theory that. Um, the G this the GKL protocol uh, using the two for one proof of work idea will solve consensus for honest majority. <coughs> this was finally our reduction um, from the properties of uh, common prefix or persistence and the fact that even the minuscule time quality we have uh, is going to be sufficient for obtaining um, validity. So I should say, um, this had an interesting implication to fairness, um, because what happens is that each set of parties' inputs is fairly represented in terms of proportionality in the blockchain. 
And this is kind of interesting because this is not the case for the Bitcoin problem uh, because of the block withholdings of this mining attacks. So this, I, this approach um, was followed by Bash and Shield. We observed that actually if you take this protocol and instead of like doing consensus, you actually go back and do a blockchain. You can actually get a blockchain protocol where the number of blocks or the number of essentially blocks that are produced by honest parts are proportional to their hash value. Where here the notion of the block has to be redefined because it's this proof of work based input. This proof of work based input in the consensus protocol I presented was uh, um, given the moniker fruit in the, in the uh, work of Bash. And they argued that. In the same way that we are here, that we can get a 50% consensus, um, they can get a blockchain where the number of blocks originating from all these parties is, is proportional to the hashing power. And this has positive implications in the incentive compatibility of, uh, of a blockchain. This also is a good example that shows how work that is done in the standard cryptographic model can also have very good implications for arguing about the rationality of, uh, of these problems. So um, this brings me to uh, basically the end of this uh, presentation with respect to um, the, uh, the GKL paper, um, which uh, established the, um, the fact that uh, this abstraction, the Bitcoin backbone, Protocol um, is a robust transaction letter. Um, and I'm going to spend the last uh, 15 minutes, I believe that I have, for um, this, uh, this presentation telling you um, about next steps. Most importantly, um, the way we define the backbone protocol in the TKL paper um, was um, restricting in many ways, one of them being that the number of parties is stuck. It's always the same, never changes. Clearly, this is not the case in the Bitcoin protocol. So the Bitcoin backbone uh, was, uh, was quite limited in, in this sense. It was referring to a protocol that makes sense only in the setting where the number of parties remains fixed um, from the beginning of the protocol till the end of the execution. Um, so, uh, when we finished that work, we found that one of the most critical open questions was actually to understand the dynamic nature of, of the problem. So, uh, and this proved to be much harder than, than I thought, or at least, like I was kind of expecting that one, one of these, but it took us a long time, um, two years, to um, get to the, the new version, of the, uh, new paper just a, a few months before um, today's date, uh, where we expand the backup protocol in the case of the dynamic, in the dynamic case, where the number of parties is evolving um, with uh, uh, the execution of the protocol. And now the protocol is modified and tries to adjust, to adjust itself to the fact that the parties do change. So, the plan remains the same though, we would like to prove the basic properties of the protocol and, and then show that the protocol still implements a robust transaction ledger in the sense of persistence and liveness, despite the fact now that the environment can fluctuate the number of parties. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this result, which is uh, an order of magnitude harder than the done the analysis of the backbone paper I presented. And given that I only have very limited time, um, I'm only going to hint about uh, the techniques that we use in, uh, in, in, this, in this paper. Nevertheless, the paper is available on inference, um, and, and you can read it um, now that you have all the material from uh, the first decay of paper, uh, you'll be able to um, follow more easily what's going on, using also some of the points that um, I would present. So, what happens in the dynamic execution? The environment creates and disables parties. Um, 
So while this is uh, something that we can easily incorporate in our model, um, this is more challenging in the case of, of blocks and protocols and, and the, in our general model from the part of paper. Um, because we have always to control the number of adversarial parties and the number of bonus parties. So we have to introduce some terminology. We have to always count, let's say, how many parties are ready and mining. We have to make assumptions about, in each round, how many parties are ready and mining and how many parties are controlled by the adversary. The fact now is that the adversary, maybe in conjunction with the environment, is introducing and removing parties. And of course, we cannot hope to prove the security of the problem if we are in a situation where somehow the number of parties that are honest and mining um, are surpassed by the others. So for this, we introduced this notion of gamma S respective environment, which basically says that in a sequence of rounds, which is smaller than S, the maximum number of parties does not exceed the factor of gamma of the minimum number of parties in that sequence of rounds. So this is a restriction by how, many, how much the number of parties can fluctuate uh, over a sequence of rounds S. Um, observe that gamma is still a multiplicative, uh, is still a multi multiplicative uh, factor here, and therefore it can accommodate an exponential growth. So basically, every S rounds, you can still get gamma more parties multiplicatively, and therefore uh, this gamma S respective environment allows an exponential growth in the number of parties in short intervals of time, of course, because we're still going to restrict the total execution to be a point. So, of course, the protocol now has to change. So, our rendering of the backbone protocol in this setting is the backbone protocol with change of variable difficulty. Because now we have to take into account, again, from the Bitcoin implementation, that change do have a different difficulty. And they also they have time stops that are affecting the way this difficulty is calculated. So, parties that don't change with the highest difficulty now and not the longest change. And without loss of generality, and even though um, the actual vector implementation does something slightly different, uh, without loss of generality, we can define the difficulty of a chain be just the summation over 1 over t of all the blocks that you find inside the chain. So uh, basically, this says that the smaller the target, the more difficult it's going to be. The good thing is that then we can also define a similar value like f the one we defined before, and that's the probability that at least one of the end parties finds a default work with target D within a round. Remember from GKL that F should not be too small or too big, and that's something that's going to be happening now here as well. Nevertheless, what's very interesting now is that T is not fixed, and it's something that depends on the view of each one's target. And actually, parties themselves may not even agree what's the right value they may be using different values of t, uh, even in the same round in the protocol execution. So, in the end, like the way we argue is that the protocol, in the way that we're going to describe it, what it does is that it tries to redefine the value of t as the protocol advances, so that the value f remains a nice, comfortable value between 0 and 1 not too small, not too big. So basically, you can think of this backbone protocol with change of variable difficulty as a protocol that tries to recalibrate T so that this critical value, F, which was so important in the properties of resistance and liveness, as you've seen in the analysis of the ZKL 14 paper, um, remains within reasonable, remains within reasonable range. Um, F is quite important, and you can see that in a, in a, in a relatively straightforward way. If, if F becomes too small, the parties will not do progress, because the chain growth will be essentially zero. On the other hand, if F becomes too large, parties may keep colliding all the time. And you can easily see that an adversary exploiting the fact that controls the network can divide the honest parties in two sets and keep them there 
by doing a adversarial schedule of the messages that are produced. So basically, the protocol can be completely broken if f is too small or if f is too big. So this motivates the fact, and motivates, let's say, our analysis and motivates the interpretation that in a dynamic environment, what the blockchain protocol should do is we calculate the target to keep the value f close to an initial correct value, which is, if you want, is the one that was originally the one coming from the first GKL paper. So basically, you can think of the first GKL paper analyzing the security of the first what we call epoch of the protocol, and then the protocol tries to recalibrate by going to the next epoch doing another instantiation of itself by calculating the correct target value. So here is a target calculation function which is extracted from the Bitcoin implementation and presented in sufficient precision um, in a single slide. Um, an important, important aspects here are the following. Um, T0 is the initial target one that, let's say, we should be scoring. And then now there's a parameter M, which is the epoch length in, M, in our blocks. There's going to be a new parameter that's going to be introduced uh, in this variable difficult to set, and determines how many blocks we have in one epoch <coughs> that are going to be used to define the target of the next epoch. Finally, this is the target in effect. So how do we compute targets. What happens in the protocol is that it operates in the following way. In every epoch, the protocol looks at how long it took to complete the last epoch. It does this using its local blockchain as a timekeeper. And then it looks at the block timestamps and Looking at the timestamps, it determines that the last epoch lasted for a certain period of time. <coughs> then it compares this to how much would the epoch have lasted if the number of parties remained the same. And using this, by this calculation, it calculates <coughs> the effective number of parties, not the actual number of parties, but the average number of parties that, if they were present, they would have produced a sequence of end blocks which took delta time to be generated. And using that, if it sees that the blockchain goes too fast, it makes the target smaller. If the blockchain goes too slow, makes the target bigger, so that it's easier to find the And this done in a linear fashion, but quite interestingly, there is a dampening effect that says, I'm not going to change it by too much. So if I see that it reaches a ceiling, which is determined by this recalculation threshold parameter, and apologies for using tau again here. Um, so if this is that, it just stops it there at that signal. It's not very clear why Bitcoin does that once you see it, because you might say, if I want to get the maximum um, sort of recalibration potential, I should allow the next target to follow the effective number of parties closely without enforcing any ceilings um, or lower bounds of that. By the way, the actual Bitcoin parameterization says that tau is 4 and m is 2016. So epochs last 2016 blocks, which is about two weeks in real time, and um, tau is the number 4. So basically, you can never go four times now or um, a quarter than the previous. Well, there was some big wisdom like in choosing the target calibration like that in the, uh, in the Bitcoin 
implementation by Nakamoto. And it's a wisdom that is nowhere uh, present in the uh, Nakamoto white, white paper. There's wisdom there thus in the implementation. So the wisdom was in introducing this threshold. And the fact that this is important became apparent when in the paper in 2013, Bach demonstrated that if actually you do not have this threshold that controls the target, and you allow the target to be recalibrated arbitrarily <coughs> with the way the parties change, there is a way to break uh, the protocol, which in our technology would be basically a common practice attack. It's kind of a very nice attack where miners in private mine a chain with timestamps that are in rapid succession, simulating the network in conditions where there are too many parties. Something that, based on target recalculation, it makes the target very hard. You might think that's kind of this kind of a stupid thing to do. The adversary, why would the adversary try to make its target harder? After all, this does not change the expectation for the adversarial success. It just makes it harder for the adversary to do it to produce a block. But the observation, which is nice here, is that this increases variance. And that's a key point. Where the honest parties will be advancing like this, the adversary will be advancing like this. And even more. And even more. And you can see the anti-concentration argument that you cannot then rule out with negative probability of error the fact that the adversary will just do a sudden burst forward to manage to bring comfort. It's a very nice attack. It actually is being um, negated by the fact that you can put an upper bound, a ceiling, and a lower bound in the target recalibration function. So this was the observation of Bach that had the attack didn't have any argument to show that the protocol actually can withstand this. What you observed was that in the full implementation that has the lower bounds and the upper bounds, his attack would, would not work. And that's why he called it a theoretical attack against him. So um, I think time is running out. Time to have five minutes. You can have whatever you want. No, no, I mean, <laughs> just because five minutes, is that? Yeah. Okay, good. So, I'm actually not going to go in. Um, I'm just going to go very uh, rushed through that. But, um, <coughs> key point here is that we, but the proof strategy is going to be the same. Well, it's going to be a typicality notion, which is going to be much more involved. And based on this typicality notion, we're going to define a, a notion of goodness for executions, which will determine how <coughs> close to reality are the targets that parties are using. Close to reality, to reality here will be determined by a notion of an ideal target, the one that we would have liked. Using that, we're going to prove that this per round goodness will enforce sufficiently correct timestamps. Observe that timestamps in this setting cannot be trusted because the adversarial blocks can contain timestamps which, of course, diverge from the actual time. And using that, using this argument, we eventually show that because the timestamps are roughly correct, uh, the way that the protocol recalculates itself is also roughly correct and eventually uh, the proof will be divided. I'm going to um, skip that forward. Um, I just hint a little bit of the difficulties we have, let's say, even defining what is a typical execution. The main problem here is that the variables we're dealing with, let's say, like this variable Q, which is the equivalent of Y in a previous analysis, it's much harder to define and reason about exactly because now it's, it's value and its behavior as a random variable depends on the execution itself. 
something that was not true in the previous analysis, where we could use, like, essentially, um, we can think of every attempt to solve a block as a Bernoulli trial. So now, it's a trial, but this defense, its success probability depends on the execution itself and the outcomes of the previous trials. This, to some of you, may suggest that the market data analysis is what is needed here, and this is exactly um, what we uh, achieve. Um, what, what we perform. So, uh, one of the main theorems showing that more poly bound execu or normal bound executions are typical uses martingale tail bounds to establish a similar theorem as the one um, that uh, we have argued uh, in the case of typical executions are uh, happen with overwhelming probability in the standard case. Obviously, I have no time to go into details. So I will skip that. I will invite you to uh, find our paper in ePrint um, and uh, see all the details here. So are we done with all this? We analyzed the Bitcoin background with, um, um, in the static and also showed you some uh, hints of it in the dynamic analysis. Well, the answer is obviously no. There's much more research that, that is needed to be done. Um, in the case of, um, in, the, in the direction of understanding the proof of security properties of proxy problems. Now, I'll just mention a little bit, some of it you um, uh, hear also in the other talks. You heard already and you will hear uh, in this in this summer. So we have like rationality and incentive compatibility, very important topic, it's going to be talked this afternoon. Um, understanding better semi-synchronous and asynchronous behavior, whatever I talked about, is uh, um, <coughs> synchronous setting is very important to do it in the synchronous or semi synchronous setting. There's already ongoing work right now by many researchers in the area, you know, giving like a definitely non exhaustive list of citations um, as a tribute to all, all these people that are working very hard to understand these problems um, in the uh, informal probable security sense. Um, we investigate alternative protocols, now we have specific objectives, and um, it's quite uh, timely now that we can ask the question. We have the objective, and we have a proof that the Bitcoin abstracted suitably meets the objective. Is the Bitcoin protocol like the best way to do that, to reach that objective? Or maybe we can design protocols which are better, more efficient, and have similar security properties. Um, are there other alternatives? So proofs of work is one way that we can um, achieve uh, this type of blockchain consensus, a robust transaction ledger, um, in this uh, non-authenticated uh, domain that uh, the Bitcoin protocol applies. But there might be other ways that can strike um, an interesting uh, balance between the centralized uh, classical, let's say, consensus approach where you have a fixed set of servers running the protocol and the completely decentralized uh, world where you have absolutely no uh, public keys or any other infrastructure to uh, track identities. There's a very, I would argue, there's a very interesting space in between. Um, this uh, um, classical centralized fixed set of servers, this is an agreement consensus setting, and Bitcoin blockchain setting. And it's very interesting to understand this intermediate space. And there are protocols that have been suggested there. Proof of stake protocols are a very interesting instance of that. And there is a very um, active and growing research on this direction, including by myself. Um, and we do hope that we will be able to understand this domain much better soon. Um, finally, you can think of all these um, protocols as um, sort of like the underlying infrastructure. Um, for doing consensus at the blockchain level. There's very many interesting things that we would like to build on top of it, um, applications at the multi-party setting, and, and this is um, another very interesting setting. Uh, and still a lot of work is to be done, presentation of which that you have already um, So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions.